All right, welcome to the November 1st, 2021 select board meeting. In accordance with an act relative to extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency and signed into law by Governor Baker, tonight's select board meeting will be conducted remotely via Zoom and will not be open to the public for physical attendance. The meeting is being recorded, live streamed and cable broadcast by the Eastern Community Access Television, which is Comcast 98 and Verizon 23 and on ECAT's website at www.eastincat.org. This meeting is closed captioned for the hearing impaired. If you're watching on your computer, you'll see a CC button on the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. If you're watching at home and you have a comment or a question, you can email Michael Blanchard at mblanchard at easton.ma.us or pose your question on the Q&A feature of the Zoom portal if you're watching us on your computer. Please remember to include your name and street address for our minutes. At this time, I'd like to ask each select board member to state their name to ensure we have a quorum. Greg Barger. Mark Lamb. Jamie Stebbins. Jennifer Stacy. And I'm Dottie Fulginetti. Welcome everyone. So the first item that we have on the agenda is a road closing request from the Easton Lions Club for their 35th annual Easton annual um, holiday festival. So we have a letter from them um, and they'll be moved into the panel, I believe, um, that they will be coordinating the 35th annual Easton Holiday Festival on Saturday, December 4th, 2021 with a rain date of Sunday, December 5th. Um, so this, they would be wanting to close the road in the area of the rockery. So we'll give them a second to log log in. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Dottie. Good to see you tonight. Good to see you too. <clears throat> Hi, Thanks Andy. for having us. Thanks for being here. Andrew, do you want to, who wants to tell us a little bit about what the festival looks like this year? You're on mute, Andy. Sorry about that. Let me start off, then I hand it off to Michelle. I'd like to start by thanking you for the citation that the, the board graciously gave us for our 90th ceremony. It worked out, worked out well. I'd say it was the highlight of the night, but the highlight had to be the, the Brockton Fife um, pipe band that, that worked out swimmingly. So, wow. um, so this is, uh, like you said, one of the, the number of um, it's a 30 somethings festival for the, uh, for the club. It's taking effect on the first Saturday of December. Um, Michelle, if you wanna come in and, and talk about a little bit, let's see what you're looking for. This is for road closure and for some, some um, permitting. Absolutely. Hi, I'm Michelle McGee. I am the chair of the Holiday Festival Main Street Stroll this year. And as Andrew said, it will take place on Saturday, December 4th. There is a kickoff event on Friday evening, December 3rd. It's an Easton Live event, which is something that's been going on since COVID's inception um, and is going to be carried over to that Friday night with a live show with bands and some holiday music. Um, then the festival will be a one day event on that Saturday with a rain date of Sunday the 5th. Um, and it will be it will be bringing back most of the traditional items that we have had in the past. The Boy Scouts are pan planning their pancake breakfast with Santa. Um, we will have a parade um, and a family show after the parade on the second floor of the Oak Ames Memorial Hall. On the first floor of the hall, there'll be a vendor and food marketplace by both local Easton vendors and the Lions Club too. Um, the train will be back and the hayrides will be back. Something that we started in 2019 that was a huge hit um, was the s'mores and fire pits in the Quisic Garden. And we will be bringing that back as well. Um, something new that we're adding uh, that we added in 2020 um, was that Santa house that went up on the Rockery last December. Um, in lieu of having a live event, we had an ECAT video um, that showed Santa coming out and um, in his little house there. So that house is actually gonna be open to the public this year. It was closed last year, but on the day of the event, it will be open and we will have a photographer there with photo ops. So in the morning, we'll do a short little, um, 
hour long session for kids that, you know, either nap or don't stay up that late. So it will be geared towards younger kids. And then after the tree lighting, which is at 445, the photographer will stay on for about an hour after that and do photos with Santa from there. So the other thing that we do is um, we have, it doesn't require road closure, but we do have a jazzed up event at the Queeset House that evening from seven to 10, where we have um, a jazz quartet that comes out. And, uh, and so, yeah, that's a cool event too, so. But if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer anything. But if there's anything logistical, John Morgan can take that. Sure. Well, I just want to um, give a little bit more detail. I was losing my place a little bit when I said it earlier. So we said that, that you're asking for the road closure, um, starting at number, uh, closing off a portion of Main Street, starting at number 72 on Saturday, December 4th, from 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. And again, the rain date will be Sunday, December 5th. The request has been circulated to Public Safety and Works and Inspectional Services Department. And we recommend, um, the town administrator recommends approval for this upon coordination with the police and the fire departments. And per the usual process, the applicant must apply for any temporary sign permits through the inspectional services. Mm -hmm. You guys are pros, especially John. So you know all the permits that you need and um, yeah. trying to get this all done. So um, did you want to add anything, John? No, Donnie, but thank you. Appreciate your support and that of our board of select persons. Uh, we've already actually been approached by our both our fire department and I'll be having uh, conversations with our police department safety officer uh, as we've done in the past to make sure that all provisions are covered and we've taken their guidance and uh, adhering to it for this event. So for people that have never been to it before that might be watching, let's just go over some of the things. Um, so the, the event is free. You might want to purchase fried dough or I assume is the fried dough booth still going to be there? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you can purchase fried dough or the best cheeseburgers that you'll ever have. <laughs> Sometimes there's famous chili there. Um, yeah. So there are things for purchase, but the idea is that a lot of it would be either free or low cost, right? That, that's precisely correct. We look at this as really a, a kickoff event for the holiday season for our friends and neighbors here around the community of Easton. And being our 35th year, it's something that, that uh, we, we've been at for a while and very happy under Michelle's guidance and, and that of Lynn Payne as well to have it evolve to include some additional events, some more interesting events. And as it continues to evolve, we're gonna do things that incorporate more of our businesses, more of our townspeople. But really the theme is uh, let's put on an event that's a lot of fun for our neighbors and friends and keep it extremely low cost. Uh, there are things there for sale. As Michelle mentioned, uh, the uh, event taking place in, within the Oak Sames Hall is uh, uh, vendors providing food and, and items for, low, for sale at that event. Um, there is a, a ticketed event on Friday night that is done in conjunction with Easton Live. It'll be a, a low cost uh, pay at the door uh, opportunity with live music. On Saturday, we're going to have the traditional family um, event that takes place upstairs in the Oak Sames Hall right after the parade ends at the Rockery area. And that is a free event, uh, always well attended. And then, as Michelle mentioned, the Quesit event there that is a, a buy ticket event that is limited to the sale of, I think, about 80 tickets. And there's few of those left as well. So folks can go to easternlions.org and get a whole lot more information on the different things that we're providing there. All of it cataloged and gone into much detail there for our folks to come and, and learn more about it. Terrific. So does anyone from the board, I'll go around starting with you, Craig, any comments, questions? Well, I just think it's a great event. I, I look forward to it every year. Mark? Uh, <clears throat> hands down, my favorite event that Easton does, that, that Lions Club does uh, every year. Kids love it. Uh, it's such family fun. And it really actually, it makes incredible memories for the kids. My kids look forward to it every year. They were really bummed about last year. Um, so uh, this is an amazing event. I've been going since the early 90s when I was 11, 12 years awesome. old. I would go to these events and I will you know, it's it stuck with me. So, um, you know, thank you for doing this. Thanks, Jamie. Yes, and with uh, kids around Mark's kids' age, uh, the same. Thank you for uh, all this involvement with community and uh, a wonderful opportunity for us to get out there with our young families and, uh, and really get to be part of the community. It's great. Jen? 
Um, nothing to add other than just same with kids that in that age bracket. It's, it's just a very exciting event. And it's really an awesome thing to see things getting back to the point where we can do more, um, you know, with precautions, of course. But I'm just really excited mm -hmm. about this event. And um, we're really lucky as a community that this is the kind of thing that happens here. Thank you. So before we take the vote, I'm just going to say a couple of, of more things because I can hear the spirit of Lee Williams in my ear saying, mm -hmm. you know, to talk a little bit more about the Lions Club. And so the Lions Club is has been around for a long time. Easton is one of the be biggest and best Lions Clubs mm -hmm. in the world. And they do that because they have such a group of people, about 160 to 170 people that get together every other week. They have a meal and they talk about what they're going to do to volunteer in the community. And if you want to be a part of that and you want to volunteer, you can do as much or as little as you want to. Mm -hmm. When I first joined, I was afraid because I'm the kind of person that can't say no to, to <laughs> helping out. And I was afraid that I would be overburdened, but I wasn't. There was things that I did volunteer for and things that I didn't. So it's just a really great way to get to know people, to contribute to the community. And if anybody is interested in joining, they can go to the Lions Club website. Um, we would be happy to have John and Andrew and Michelle invite you to a meeting. So Absolutely. You come and meet everybody and see if you like it and try it on before you make a commitment. The other thing is, one of the other things the Lions Club does that's amazing is clean the rockery in that area before the festival. Um, I got an email about that and I can't remember if it's this weekend or the following weekend, but John, do you have a cry for volunteers to come out and help for that? We certainly do. Show up on the morning of Saturday, November 13th. Just, just bring your strong back. If you've got a rake or a leaf blower, bring it along too. And this is absolutely an example of many hands making light work. And uh, we'll spend a couple of hours cleaning up the rockery area, getting all those leaves up and fingers crossed that those leaves drop between now and, and the 13th. But we'll clean that area up. We'll have plenty of coffee and donuts for anybody who shows up and we'll have a good time in the process. Great. So I think I've covered about all of it. So um, yeah. with yeah. that, I would take a motion uh, to accept the road closing request to, for the Easton Lions Club 30. Fifth annual Easton Holiday Festival on December 4th, 2021. So moved, Barger. Second, Lamb. Barger and Lamb, back to you, Craig. Barger, yes. Lamb, yes. Sevens, yes. Stacy, yes. And Full Genetti, yes. Thanks so much for being here tonight. Good to see your faces. Our pleasure. Thank you so our appreciation to the community of Easton for helping our club be so successful. Thank you, now. Thank Have a good you so evening. much. You Bye. too. Okay, next we have um, the department update for Easton Fire Health and Community Services, Emergency Medical Services, Mobile Integrated Health and Public Health Officer presentation. Uh, sure, so while uh, our presenters are moved over, back before COVID, we used to much more regularly have uh, department heads come in and just give periodic updates to the Board of the Public on uh, some of the major initiatives their departments are working on. As the board will recall, as part of a fiscal 22 budget, uh, we included funding for a new position of public health officer shared between uh, fire and the Department of Health and Community Services to formalize the relationship that really got built there um, over many, many years and was put to great uh, a great test and came through quite well, in my opinion, during the pandemic. Uh, and they've been doing some great work. Uh, there's been some news coverage of that recently, and we thought it would be a good time uh, for Chief Alexander, Director Kennedy, and Public Health Officer, but mostly to give an update on the good work that they've done and what they will be doing uh, in the coming months and years. So I don't know which of the three of you I'm handing it to, but uh, one of you. <laughs> well, I will, uh, I'll start out. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having us. Um, and I think believe Kristen is going to share her screen for the presentation. Um, we're very excited uh, to be here and share um, what's transpired over the number of months. Um, you know, I, I have to point out that there's a lot of credit that comes even to Chief Parchers before this because I came in. This was a gift um, as a fire chief to have this, uh, you know, starting out when I took over in May and to be able to be on the ground floor of helping it develop and be a part of this great team. Uh, it was, it was great, amazing planning and, and such a great thing to have uh, for the town of Easton. So what we've done is um, 
we've taken the project and it's not really done anywhere else, um, uh, especially quite like we're doing it. So we are inventing it as we go and developing it and finding ways. And I think you'll see through this presentation that um, we are adaptable and flexible and, and trailblazing in a lot of ways. And uh, I hope you, you'll you feel that uh, you are being served well by these physicians by the end of this presentation. And as always, uh, you can ask questions uh, throughout or even at the end, we'll have a spot for you. So with that, Kristen, I think we'll dive right in. And my keyboard slide. is not letting me work, letting me move. There we go. Right, we'll get there. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I think a lot of it is to understand the background of where we're coming from. Um, you know, HCS and EMS and fire, uh, they've always been very separate. Of course, we help each other when we need to, um, but a few things have happened over the years. You know, so we started kind of with what is EMS? So emergency medical uh, services, that's your ambulance, your paramedics, your EMTs. Um, you know, Easton is predominantly uh, almost completely paramedics now, which is the highest level of care. Um, but how has it changed and what has caused us to want to drive towards this MIH program? And with that, I'll be explained in more detail. But EMS started a long time ago, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, you'd see the old Cadillac station wagons and um, you'd have even police involved in that aspect, directly caring. And what really started out was people would call for an ambulance to get taken to the hospital. It was really a, a, a it's taxi with lights and sirens. We would put people in the back. And then get in the front, no one would stay in the back with them, and we drive them to the hospital. No one would provide any care, uh, just a really fast ride. Um, <clears throat> and then we started to say, geez, I wonder if we could help these people. And we said, okay, well, maybe if we have oxygen and some band aids and bandages and splints, and we can start providing basic care, which is where our BLS, if you hear BLS and ALS, BLS is the basic life support. That's the, the, the first level of care that we have in our system. And then as we progress, especially on the West Coast coming into the 70s, if you have, uh, I've ever seen the show Emergency, Johnny Gage, um, that's where our ALS came from, advanced life support. We'd have IVs and medications and defibrillators and all sorts of tools and, and things we could do. And we really brought the emergency room out into the ambulance. Uh, about 30 years ago in this region, 35 years ago, that ALS really reached the East Coast, especially the Northeast. And fire departments and many communities decided they were going to have paramedics instead of EMTs in their ambulances. And they would send paramedics to school and hire only paramedics like Easton does. And over the last 30 years, that ALS has developed into what you see today as a premier um, you know, microcosm or emergency room in the back of an ambulance. And it's quite amazing what we can do. Um, but what's happening now is that just like we did um, in a few other aspects of the world, we've come to the conclusion that um, we are um, providing uh, about as best as possible service we can pre-hospital reactive 911. Uh, meaning that when you have an emergency, you call us and we've got everything we need. But uh, we've reached a point now where, where do we go? We had that big uh, key watershed moment 35 years ago where we said ALS was the way to go. We needed paramedics. And now we're saying, okay, where do we go now? We've mastered the paramedic side, the reactive service, where do we go? And where do we go is with our partners over at HCS and our MIH program. And I'm very excited to turn it over to Kristen to talk about her side of the world and, uh, and then bring in uh, uh, Tim Vimosi to really tie it all together. Thanks, Chief. So what is HCS? Um, you know, we're getting really good at using that acronym, but it is, um, Back in 2015, we had the idea to bring together four departments, Health, Council on Aging, Recreation, and Veterans Services, under one administrative umbrella, with the thought being that we all have a similar mission, but by putting one administrative umbrella over the four, we could really get to the root of a lot of different issues and actually share a lot of resources and share a lot of information. And I think one of the things you, a lot of you will hear me have heard me say over and over again, I think one of the most driving things for me was taking the whole World Health Organization idea that health is more than the absence of disease or infirmary. And just like the chief's analogy, it's more than just getting somebody to the hospital now. We wanna take a step in and where we can and promote states of physical, mental, and social well-being. And the four departments 
under health and community services are now really taking an active role in doing that. And over the past six years that um, the department has existed, I think one of the biggest changes is knowing their workers and knowing what the other departments can offer as resources. I think it's a personal triumph that my health inspectors will ask when they're out dealing with somebody who's having housing issues. They'll dig a little bit deeper. They'll ask, are you a veteran? They'll ask about other situations that might be going on because they know they have coworkers on the other side of the aisle that have resources. And rather than just handing out information, they'll actually take somebody's hand and walk them to the next person in the chain that can actually help them get closer to that state of physical, mental, and social well-being. So that's who we come together is MIH. And as you can see from the slide, we saw the value in combining our efforts, things that we had already been doing ahead of time. Fire had always worked close, closely with Council on Aging on slips and falls. They'd always worked closely with us at the health department on things like sharps and hoarding. But now, as the chief said, we have a broader lens that we're looking through. And seeing that combining our efforts, we could create a position and that that was actually what was going to be needed to have a person who could take a lot of these ideas from our two silos and bring them together. So in developing this position, we did set the minimum standards as a paramedic. Um, as the chief mentioned, now we only hire paramedics, but there are still some EMTs. We set the bar at paramedic. And once again, we have overachievers in our ranks. And we ended up filling the position with not only a paramedic, but a paramedic who is also an MSN RN. So in May of 2021, firefighter Tim Vimosi was appointed to this position and now is located in an office at Frothingham Hall. Monday through Thursday, where he's accessible um, to the public and where we're running some of the programs that we've al already gotten started out of. So with that, I will turn it over to Tim. Uh, thank you, Director Kennedy. And uh, thank you to the uh, chair, co-chair, rest of the select board, uh, Administrator Reed, Chief Alexander, and of, uh, of course our residents for allowing me to uh, do this um, presentation this evening. Um, so when we look at mobile integrated healthcare and, and what it is, uh, the chief spoke about uh, the history of the fire department. And, um, you know, we're, if, you, if you guys have had the uh, opportunity to attend any of our ceremonies at the firehouse, you know that we, uh, we were very steeped in tradition. And um, what we always like to do is we like to look at the tradition of our past to kind of guide where we're going in the future. And it's um, the same here with mobile integrated healthcare. We can relate it to um, in the past of, you know, the firemen with the, uh, the long beards and the buckets putting out fires. Uh, they were taking the fight to the fire and they realized, hey, we have to do some collaboration with other departments and figure out how we can prevent these fires from happening. Um, now that the fire department has evolved to have, you know, building codes and fire codes and all these things in place, um, we see ourselves kind of uh, getting very heavy into the medical side. Over 70% of our calls have some kind of medical basis to them. And um, we're trying to take that proactive approach again. We're taking um, evidence-based practice that we've seen in the field on the clinical side, bringing that to the emergency medical side and really putting out a, um, a new product of preventative care um, rather than just waiting for them at the emergency to occur. Um, so we're, we're kind of taking that proactive approach to how we do things. Um, and that's really the basis of um, what um, MIH is, um, the foundation of, of where we're going, what we're trying to build here. Um, so uh, I guess the next question is, what can MIH do for our residents? Um, so over the past year, we've kind of uh, knocked our heads together um, and come up with where we see um, needs in our community, uh, where we've seen um, emergency call outs um, that have a, a basis and something a little bit larger than the uh, 911 moment. And this list that you see before you, fire prevention and burn prevention education, sharps awareness, home safety, homelessness, housing instability, uh, home and community fall prevention, children with special care needs evaluation, emergency preparedness, uh, individual evaluations, child passenger safety, window fall prevention, vaccinations. This is kind of um, the, the, the large ones that were readily apparent to us. Um, so we kind of took, uh, took to the task of addressing these. And what we did is we um, applied to the state to become approved as a community EMS provider, uh, meaning that we're going to expand our normal scope of practice to encompass uh, the needs of our community that were uh, readily apparent to us 
um, through all of these emergency situation calls. And it wasn't just the fire department that recognized these needs. It was that, uh, I, and I, I can, I'm gonna say it a hundred times tonight, but it was really the, the collaboration between departments uh, where they were able to, to um, point these things out to each other. So it was us running into a housing instability situation that would require the Board of Health um, to, to come and intervene as well. So it wasn't just uh, one department saying this, it was multiple departments looking at things from multiple aspects that come up with this list. Um, and some of these programs were already in place. A lot of these programs, um, or a couple of them, um, were already being uh, addressed and that we now have the opportunity through that community MS to kind of um, expand um, and you know, uh, constantly improve upon. Uh, and one of those is the uh, SHARPS Awareness Program. So this SHARPS collection program um, is probably one of our older collaborations. And um, I, I know I've spoken to a, the select board before on this topic. Um, back in 2012, when the legislature decided to ban residential sharps from um, the trash, this was one of the first things that Chief Partridge and I undertook together. Um, and it was that driving sense that prevails in Easton that we do things because it's the right thing to do and because there's a need, not because we have to. Um, and in 2012, when these items were banned from the residential trash, towns didn't have to do anything, but we did step up and we came up with kind of a, an easy program at the time, but it didn't fully meet the community's needs. And over time, we've added to that. We've added a second household, um, second collection day. We always did the household hazardous waste day, but we've added on working with Wings of Hope and with the police department to also try to piggyback on the DEA drug take back day in the fall. And now we're realizing a longstanding goal. Um, and that is that we are proud today to say we have a Sharps drop off kiosk that will be opening to the public. Um, it will be for Easton residents and they will be able to dispose of their sharps Monday through Friday, year round. They will no longer have to wait for an annual collection day. They will no longer have to purchase cumbersome um, red boxes that we sell and then they have to transfer things to. We'll be able to um, have this service readily available to all of our residents every day that the um, fire station on Bay Roads administrative offices are open. <clears throat> the next thing that we've accomplished um, and as part of this collaboration, which I, have, I still scratch my head and say, we've, we're only six months into this and this was an idea on a piece of paper. Um, so the fact that we actually have these things up and running to me is, um, is just absolutely wonderful. So one of the things that we had lost, um, the health department had lost with our contract to, um, with the Visiting Nurse Association was the ability to provide community health clinics. Um, we had in the past with that contract held a blood pressure clinic once a week at a, at a random location. One week it was at Town Hall, one week it was at um, the Housing Authority, one week it was at Frothingham. And quarterly, we did blood pressure, I mean, I'm sorry, blood sugar checks. We have been able to reinstate this program. They are currently happening every week at Frothingham Hall and at Parker Terrace. We have paramedics who are on site and able to do weekly blood pressure checks as well as blood sugar checks. And the interaction really provides an opportunity to educate residents on additional programs and resources, but it also is a great opportunity for us to form bonds with um, and fester trusted relationships with the residents in town. And I'll let Tim talk about how um, some of the information that he's gathering or his people are gathering in these interactions translates into real life changes for some of our residents. Yeah, and it's, it's one of the greatest things about these programs. Um, so it, it's not just me out there doing this. I'm, I'm uh, you know, I, I do have uh, a training in family uh, practice, uh, but it also allows us to bring that training back to other paramedics. So it's not just me out there. It's, uh, it's a lot of our paramedics that come out and uh, uh, become kind of ingrained in our community. Um, some of the simplest things um, that, that we can do is, is take a, a blood pressure and a blood sugar um, for us as a technical skill. But the, the real magic of what happens here is the interaction you have with the community. And a lot of these folks have been um, 
unfortunately isolated like so many others during COVID. Um, and they, they, this is their first opportunity to get out and really get back into uh, preventative healthcare. Um, simple questions like, you know, uh, such as, uh, are you taking your medications uh, on a weekly basis can really make an impact on a patient's uh, outcome uh, much further down the road. Um, because just that simple medication reconciliation um, can, can really lead to the very positive outcomes as they uh, go through their healthcare journey. Um, so simple conversations like that, um, a lot of times what comes up as well is uh, medication insecurity, food insecurity, housing insecurity, all of the things that come up in just a regular interaction um, with a, hey, how you doing? Uh, let's take a look at that blood pressure. It can really uh, lead down the road to much bigger uh, problems and the opportunity to provide those solutions for these patients. Um, on, on a weekly basis. So uh, building those uh, relationships through trust uh, week after week, and also giving them the tools to take back to their physicians um, to, to, to really secure their healthcare is, is very important. Uh, the, the couple of things on the table that you see there are your, you know, your stethoscope, uh, your sharps container, that kind of thing, but there's two little pieces of paper there. Uh, one of them is a file of life, which really allows them to interact with us um, in the emergency medical services through uh, uh, pre-planning, um, communication in the terms of what medications are on and so forth. Uh, so that when we arrive there, that's not a headache for them. They can really just hand us a piece of paper and we can get them the care they need right away. Um, the other one is just a blood pressure tracker. And that's something very simple. It's tactile. They can take right back to their physician. Um, and that's a way for us to communicate with their healthcare provider to keep them out of the emergency room um, so that they don't have that emergency. And that's just uh, two very simple steps um, in the MIH program. But the communication that we have um, with these folks is also carried on to, a, to another uh, part of this program, which I'm very excited about, and that's our uh, children with special health care needs. Um, again, this really comes down to um, a lot of um, medicine through communication. Um, and this program is designed to kind of um, give parents um, and anybody really um, with a special care need uh, in the community to reach out to us prior to an emergency. Um, and what they do is they can, they can give me a call or uh, give the fire department a call or the board of health a call. Um, and we can schedule an appointment with them where they can, uh, can either go out to them, they can come to me, whatever works best. And I'll provide them with a, uh, a binder, which you see in the middle. And what this binder contains is basically some simple forms um, that are prepared by uh, healthcare practitioners um, on the clinical side and emergency responders on the emergency side. Uh, we've kind of collaborated to create this form. It goes on uh, hard copy paper. They take it back to their provider they fill out everything we need to know as first responders. And I, I, again, I'm gonna use the term first responders to encompass all of our departments. Um, but they take that back, they fill it out, it gives us this information so that um, when we arrive in the midst of an emergency um, or a natural disaster with uh, you know taking this week in stride, um, we have all of this information in place. So um, as a first responder, I can arrive there and I can uh, be directed to this binder. I can see that this, um, uh, patient in that home has all these special cares um, that they require. Um, and then I can take that with me to the emergency room, pass that on to them. They can take that information. It goes back to the health care provider and the circle continues. But the best part about this is, is that we're ready for it before we get there. Um, the town has taken uh, great measures to increase our technology and preparedness for our emergency response. And one of the biggest steps we took in the past two years was SEMREC. Um, we can take a lot of the information that's in here put it into the computers at our 911 dispatch center. And that's actually put out to us um, in, the, in the cruisers and fire trucks before we get there. So if there's a special need where maybe we need to approach the scene um, uh, without lights and sirens um, to provide a safe environment for that person in the home uh, before we get there, we'll know that before we get there. So we're not creating a larger problem. Uh, the other thing that I can do is I can take special medication orders, special transport. Um, if somebody needs to go to a specific hospital for a specific care, um, we can take care of all the, the, the paperwork and medical director issues that come on before that, so that when our paramedics get there, all of those standing orders from that physician are already in place, so they don't have to um, get on the phone and make other phone calls that may delay the care that that person needs right away. Um, and this even goes as far as, um, you know, in our community, we've had um, a lot of special care needs in the past. We've actually had to uh, have uh, pre-standing orders to call in, you know, medical hel helicopters and all these kinds of things. But the, the beauty of it is all of this is kind of put into a small package that's hard copy so that in the case of an, a disaster where electronics aren't available, we have it in our hands um, and we can provide them the care they need. And it's also in an electronic version so that circle of communication is never broken. They can change it as needed, we can update it as needed, and we can continue there. Um, 
So that's kind of that program. Uh, but expanding these programs um, also takes uh, an expansion in our understanding of why we're doing what we're doing. And that really ties into how we train ourselves and how we best prepare ourselves to give those higher level services. Um, we've uh, taken a few steps into that. One of them um, I, was, I was also very happy with was getting some car seat installation technicians. Um, it sounds like something very simple, uh, but it's one of those things that um, anybody who has uh, been through that portion of parenthood knows that can be quite a headache or grant parenthood or uh, just, you know, helping out uh, a family <laughs> with uh, transporting a child, uh, getting those car seats into the cars and the um, uh, evolution that occurs in that field is, um, it can be daunting. Uh, so we had a few people in our, um, in our department um, step up to uh, kind of take on that task. And I'm very pleased to say uh, that they'll be available to, um, to help people out in that uh, aspect. Um, Another thing, you know, we got to mention COVID. It wouldn't be a, a good select board meeting without COVID being mentioned. Um, so uh, the um, Board of Health has been very kind in allowing me to join in in their efforts of addressing um, the community needs in that respect as well. And one of the programs that we use to address COVID is uh, Maven. It's a disease tracking system. Um, they've been uh, very kind as to bring me in on some of that training. So um, I'm able to assist uh, in, in the monumental task of um, addressing those things through technology. Um, so that's just part of it. And then as we uh, continue into our training aspects, we've had to take on um, other opportunities. Um, one of the things we've done recently um, was pair with a company called uh, PCI. Um, they're a uh, training institute. And we've, as we expand our services, we really have to get into why we're doing what we're doing. And I've, I've learned over past meetings to, um, uh, you know, steal ideas from other um, uh, uh, presenters and Uma from the library has always taught me very well to bring a prop. I apologize, it's on COVID. I don't know if you can see it there, but uh, this little device in my hand, I was trying to use it as a mouse earlier when I was signing on, that's why I couldn't unmute, uh, is actually an ultrasound machine. Um, so as you can see, it's very small, it's very portable. It plugs right into an iPad or a uh, cell phone and it allows us to, um, well, it's been described as a flashlight into the body. It lets us look into the body to see what we're doing. Uh, what we're doing. So we as first responders can now um, take a look, um, not just at the person on the outside, uh, but take a look at the interior of the body and see what that disease process or trauma uh, is happening there. And then we can take that and give them the best care and take them to the best place that will best address what's going on with them. In order to do that, though, we kind of have to know what we're doing, right? So this is a non-invasive procedure that we're taking people. And then we have advanced invasive procedures that we have to practice on. Um, and we've really taken that up to the step as the same level as a lot of medical schools use, where we are actually going to be doing um, um, advanced procedures on donated tissue. Um, so we're actually um, practicing the, the procedures that we'll be doing on live tissue, um, or I should say on donated tissue um, in a live setting um, in a very safe manner. So it's, it's uh, really a, a, a kind of a, a new road that uh, paramedics really haven't gone down. Um, but one that I'm, I'm very happy to say with the support of our community, we're able to do. Um, and we don't just do it on, on donated tissue. There's, uh, there's the state of an art uh, lab down there, which has these interactive mannequins. Um, and we were actually fortunate enough to bring down some of our community members there to experience it, um, where the, the, the mannequins actually uh, react to what you're doing as you practice. So as we bring in um, our, our, our technicians to, to practice their skills, they're able to um, do so in a as close to live um, reenactment as possible uh, through this um, state-of-the-art training facility. So it's, it's really a, a, a new thing. I think we're the first in our region to really take it on and um, something that I'm, I'm very excited about for our members to, to get into. Um, yeah, and so this, uh, this training right here is, is gonna directly impact the, the services that we can give. So as we expand our training to really to, to become state-of-the-art there, um, the, the best part is all of that training comes back to our community in a state of the art way. Uh, so they get the top line services. Um, so all of that being said, uh, now that we kind of seen uh, where we started and where we are and how we're getting to the next step, what are the next steps? And um, one of the next programs, I think, uh, uh, I, 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 I keep saying I'm excited about, but it is kind of exciting, is uh, the, uh, the uh, Welcome Home program. Uh, this is kind of another new program that's really not really seen in the EMS world or uh, community EMS world, um, but it's going to be a program where we, we take the opportunity to, to welcome our newest residents uh, into the town. 
uh, we're going to meet with them within their uh, first eight weeks after uh, they're born and offer them um, all kinds of things. So we're going to uh, educational resources for nutrition, parenting, safety, uh, family assistance, anything really that they need to uh, be a part of our community in that new way um, is very exciting for us um, and uh, something that I'm looking forward to taking on. Um, and I think Director Kennedy was going to make a few comments on the next video. Yep. So as we, you know, again, as we move forward, um, we have a real luxury, I feel, here in Easton that we're encouraged and supported to look through our responses, look at our responses through a very human lens. Um, we don't just think about nuts and bolts. We think about what, how people are impacted and what we can do as a community of town employees to help the greater community. And we saw this during COVID and it was little things like supplying masks and thermometers to people that were in isolation, checking in with them as part of our um, COVID response and needing to interview them and find out who they had been around, but also making sure they had everything they needed. And we've taken that um, a step further with this last storm response where um, you know, we became aware of some neighborhoods that were completely cut off. Um, people could not get out with their vehicles and those same human needs were looked at and we had staff that was able to respond and go out and talk and find out if people needed diapers or formula or medication. Uh, again, we're just, I'm very excited because this takes, again, back to that World Health Organization definition of health. We're looking at all aspects of a person's life, not whether or not the tree fell on them, but the tree falling impacted them. And what can we do as a response that hits the human things that are going to allow them to be healthy in the long run? Um, so that it's... It's very exciting to see what's coming next. Um, it's very exciting to be working with such an amazing team um, who are just really committed to making the right things happen. Um, myself and the chief were both on the phone with local propane companies um, over the week and trying to get them reassured enough that they would come out and put propane in people's tanks so that um, people would have heat. Um, it's very exciting and uh, we're moving ahead. I think yep. Chief Alexander so, is going to wrap us up, take so us home. <laughs> we're, we're, you know, Director Kennedy and, and, and Tim uh, Mimosi have really deserved the lion's share of uh, all the accolades that come to this program. Uh, I'm, I'm humbled to have such great people um with me and and leading this program and uh, i would definitely encourage anybody who any of the services that we've talked about tonight uh to reach out uh, you can call ACS, uh, hcs during business hours you can also call the Easter fire department at the phone number you see on your screen uh for those who are on uh, the phone it's 508-230-0750 um, and we will help you out with those uh, situations you may have or at least give you in the right direction if it's not a service we do provide at this time um, you know, in closing, I, I think it's really important to point out that, um, you know, what Director Kennedy and Tim Vimosi have done is just not done in, anywhere around us. You know, I've been, I started, my first memories were as a, a little child were in the fire station and in a, in a fire-based EMS system. And then I've been myself a part of this for over 20 years. And, um, you know, it, it, it's just something that you don't see. And to have Easton be the one on the map that others are going to come to, to model after. Um, that's a tribute to everybody on the select board, the residents of Easton supporting us and uh, allowing us the opportunity to provide this level of um, care and um, compassion to be able to get out there. We have the resources to do it. And uh, we wanna make sure that all of you understand that, you know, the value you have from this program and where you're getting it and uh, to, keep, to keep it going forward so we can keep developing it. So with that, um, we certainly take any questions. Um, we appreciate everything you all do for us every day. Uh, and we wanna to continue to be there for you. Well, thank you so much. What a, a great deal of information. Um, I noticed that Corey Ahonen is in the um, attendees and I just wanna thank Corey for uh, his involvement in this as well. 
Um, gonna just open it up and go through our regular rotation on the board members for their comments and questions. Um, and we'll start with you, Craig. This is an incredibly exciting opportunity and, and I kudos to the chief, to Kristen, to Timmy for, for doing this. Um, when I was a kid, I grew, I grew up in a medical family. And when I was a kid, the doc would come to the house. They would, they'd make house calls so that they would be able to integrate all the services that anybody needed. Um, and so I, I just, I'm just really excited about what you guys are doing um, and, and what a great benefit it is to the community and to the constituents that we have in Easton. So thank you all for doing this and for reaching out and being creative. Thanks, Craig. Thank you. Mark. Yeah, um, guys, this is absolutely incredible. Um, you know, as, as, as Chief, you mentioned, you, know, you guys are the model for every other community. Um, I, I bet other communities can't even conceive of what it is you're doing, um, let alone actually be doing it. Uh, you know, the level of care is dramatically increasing. Um, and the seconds count, the knowledge counts. And, you know, the, uh, the program you have where if a child has a pre-existing condition, you enter into that home <clears throat> knowing this condition um, is, you know, as, as a parent uh, of a child who has a, you know, a, a history of, uh, of, of seizure and stroke, for you guys to know that should anything happen coming into my home, I can't begin to tell you the level of comfort that brings, that brings. So um, that's amazing. Thanks, Mark. Jamie. Yeah, and Mark, thanks for sharing that because I think that is that is it. It's knowing that we've got the the best um, team, you know, equipped in the fact that you guys are tip of the spear. You are leading the way, and, and Chief, I, I think you put it right. Other communities will come to you, and they will be seeking your guidance um, as Easton has, has, has proven in, in many other areas too, that um, the leadership in this town is, is fantastic. And this is a great example of that. Uh, Tim, I've gotten to know over the past uh, several years and couldn't, couldn't think of a, a better guy to be involved and to be uh, stepping into this new role uh, that you all have um, so thoughtfully uh, brought together with a lot of hard work too, a lot of background, you know, a lot of steps had to be taken to get you to where you are today. And it's the research, it's the, it's the effort. Uh, it's the things I've seen Tim been working on from very early on, always asking questions and wanting to know what, how can we do it better? And, and, and that's, you know, I, I think a, a huge attribute to this entire group is everyone always asking, and Kristen, you as well, how can we do it better? So thank you very, very much. Very proud to be part of this community. And this is a great example of why. Thanks, Jamie. Jen. Uh, yeah, I, I'll echo the same, that this is such an awesome program and such a great way to break down silos across areas that really do need good synergy. Um, so it's absolutely fantastic. And this is a side note, my kids, every time the Eastern Fire Department comes to the school to do some sort of program, I hear about it for like the next two or three days. So um, those littlest learners across the, the community really are absorbing that all. I do have a few questions um, that were triggered by the awesome presentation. Um, the first one is what unique metrics are you looking at over the coming period to assess what's working and, and what's not and are there areas of opportunity? I would uh, ask Tim if you'd like to comment on that. Yeah, so I think as we open up the program, um, the first part is going to be getting the information out there and seeing how many uh, call outs for services are required. Uh, where it's a new program, I think uh, we're taking that first step and getting out there. And once we start seeing um, where those uh, calls come in and the volume at which they come in, uh, we can address them there. And then as they come in, uh, we can also adjust this. As the chief said earlier, it's kind of a, a moving target. We react to the to the um, opportunities given, as I like to say. Um, so as, as those calls come in, we can always um, uh, build those. One of the other things that we have in, uh, put in place over the past year was a new um, uh, medical uh, record tracking system on our, on our fire department side, uh, which actually allows us to make statistical databases uh, available for us to analyze. Um, so as we move forward in that, we're able to enter some of that information into there. We can look at that. Um, and the introduction of SEMREC into the system allows us to see how many times we're being called out to houses for special care, um, for example, for special care needs. So um, as we enter these um, information points into our, our dispatch database, we can analyze it over a span of time, let's say six months or a year or whatever we choose, um, and see how many times we're being called out for these services, 
how our response times are improved by these services. And uh, basically, um, as we keep those lines of communication open with those families, how they feel about the services we're giving um, as we, we keep those lines of communication open. So um, those are just a few examples. And again, as we, as we go forward in the MIH process, um, I'm, I'm sure we'll um, take whatever opportunity we can um, to find those quality improvement um, indicators um, as, as we go. Awesome. The other question, well, I have two questions beyond that. Um, the next one is around outreach. Um, so obviously there's the, the programs where you're going and knocking on doors, you're getting out in the community and probably using every avenue you can to be at events and, and whatnot. Um, and then there's always Facebook and social media, but how are you reaching out to the populations that are maybe the most vulnerable and maybe not on, don't have internet access or don't use that for their um, you know, regular um, communication activities? Yeah, sure. So um, one of the things that we do is the, um, uh, well, uh, word of mouth is a, is a big one, especially in the, um, the elderly services community. Um, as, as, uh, as we've developed this program, we've, we've gone out and created relationships with uh, Stewart Healthcare, Old Colony Elderly Services, uh, a couple of the VNAs. Um, and um, through those um, referral processes, a lot of word of mouth is spread. So we actually have uh, built a lot of relationships over the past year and before and, and hope to build more as we go along um, with some of those um, community outreach programs. So um, that collaborative outreach where we're reaching out through our marketing uh, on social media and various outlets, uh, actually going down to the um, elderly housing areas like uh, Parker Terrace and Lee Circle or Housing Authority um, and meeting people face to face um, and um, through our school systems, through, I mean, you name it, we're taking every opportunity and every avenue we can to get there. Um, but I think a lot of it's just going to be continually building these uh, relationships and that, that uh, bridge of uh, trust um, through all those, um, through those avenues. Could I just add in, I, and I, I hope I'm not misspeaking here, Tim, but I think uh, specifically with uh, the program around uh, children who may have special medical needs, uh, you will be working directly with uh, Eastern Public Schools Director of Special Education Services as well, right? So we're trying to leverage uh, the existing uh, different agencies and um, kind of uh, jurisdictions, so to speak, within the town and school government uh, to try to make sure we're getting that message out to population bases that are already being served by other parts of the government. That's correct. Yeah, I, I like the term, the, the phrase wrap around care, um, where it's not just uh, us trying to communicate out. It's um, a lot of different services all communicating and reaching out at the same time to provide a kind of that, that blanket of care um, around a particular individual. And as we get closer to that program being just about ready to come online, we've developed a um, promotional piece, but I've also worked with the director of special ed um, and sent it over to her for her review. We wanna make sure that she's got an inside track on what parents might be looking for, what questions they may have from anything we're putting out. So we're actually putting it in front of her before we even go to print and saying, we need your input, we need your feedback. Um, I think you know the three of us just pride ourselves on being able to build bridges and to make those relationships, whether they're with the community or whether they're also with other staff and other departments within the community. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, just dovetailing all that, the, we all know that there's a, in people who have these needs, there's a professional somewhere who knows these people have the needs. It's hard for us to go directly to the people and find that they have the needs. It's using our professional knowledge to make contact with the professionals who know, if you can follow that. So every time we make a contact with another professional um, who has people who have the needs, that's how we're going to get the referrals. Um, it's really going to be hard, you, you know, knocking on all of our doors in town is, a, is an admirable goal, but we can get a lot more progress through these great relationships we're building. And uh, we'll start to see it as it gets out there, like the car seat program. Um, I've dealt with that in my past. And once the word gets out, you're doing them every day. And that's a great thing. Also, just the location of Tim's office. Also, we didn't leave him in the firehouse. We put him in Frothingham Hall. And for the first four months that he sat at his desk, we had him at a desk right inside the door. So he saw people coming and going and saw some of the other services that were being 
offered that now he's more aware of. So now he's in the building where people are. He's in the building where a lot of other professionals are that provide these different services and resources. Um, and that wasn't just because we had an extra desk. That was a very thoughtful decision to put him where he needed to have his ears. Jen, did you have any other questions? Uh, yeah, my last question was just around um, if mental health resources and programming was on the horizon, because that's like a big area, I feel like, of, of opportunity. I'm sure you guys have already thought about it, so. Absolutely. Um, you know, we've been working on it, Connor. I don't know if you'd like to bring yeah, something in. Sure. So um, it's a great question, and it's something we all care deeply about, and we are uh, working on right now. Uh, we all just lost a week uh, due to the storm, yes, we but we are working with this same core group plus uh, Chief Sullivan and Deputy Boone uh, on a comparable um, shared services model, uh, again, with health and community services as kind of the uh, connective tissue with police uh, who currently work uh, on a volunteer basis on a shoulder tap program, following up with folks who have uh, overdosed uh, and people uh, who are struggling with addiction, the police department will be um, getting a community resource officer uh, unit off the ground, hopefully this fiscal year, uh, depending on their staff levels. And uh, we are working now using uh, ARPA funds to uh, finalize a job description for a, a licensed social worker, a civilian social worker to be hired full time to work uh, shared between police and health and community services in a similar model that you're seeing with the public health, the physical health aspect that uh, uh, Tim Vamosi is filling with fire. So uh, we will be working on that. Uh, and hopefully within, uh, before the holidays, we'll have the uh, more to say on that um, uh, and uh, we'll be advertising uh, for the job. And you know, um, just like Krista pointed out, um, strategically putting people next to each other makes a difference. And we're working, I see Kristen shaking her head, like it matters. So this new position um, that will be posted, uh, will be sitting right next to Tim. And we come in contact with so many people who need services, whether it's, you know, mental health spreads across a lot of things from, from hoarding to, you know, medication issues that cause them. There's different, so many different things that get captured in mental health. And we come across it and we don't, in the fire service, we don't know where to call. It's hard for us to find help. And now they're gonna be sitting next to each other. So when we refer to Tim, Tim can just turn and look at somebody and say, we got to do something and now we can. So right. it's, it's, it's just an amazing resource. So I'm so looking forward to this. Yeah, it's the same, the same goal of, of providing our police, our firefighters, our health agents care deeply. They're highly trained, they're very knowledgeable. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's not their full-time job to be a mental health specialist or to be uh, a nurse. And so creating these more focused roles, in-housing these roles, we hope will allow us to uh, provide more follow-up care, uh, to provide more ongoing um, recurring care outside of an like kind of acute crisis response mode and, and have more proactive um, checking in and providing of resources and referrals for folks uh, who need um, uh, more care than than just having you know nine one one be dialed in the moment of crisis. Thank you. This is such incredibly like forward thinking, proactive leadership. So great job, everybody involved. So I'm just I'll wrap it up with a couple of thoughts that I had. I'm just thinking about how lucky we are to have our town uh, staff feel comfortable enough. I mean, they all work uh, you know incredible hours. Um, a lot of passion in their jobs, but to be able to think of, but we can even do more and add more workload. And, and uh, you know, it's, I just think it's great that our staff feels comfortable enough in their jobs that they can bring things like that forward and really enthusiastically um, want to create. You know, I, I'd love to say this was a directive by the select board. We thought it up and we asked for it. We didn't even have to. So I, I'm really happy about that. And I'm just, I, you know, I was writing notes to myself, imagining all the, the cases of how this could work if somebody had dementia and, you know, that was in their file before 
before you got there or you know when you said with the lights and uh sirens if if somebody had autism in that family like these are these are really really important things that are going to make them feel better you know i was reading before where a particular fire department when they would show up you know your job is really just to you know get the people safe and and uh and and get them to to help right away but this particular fire department was looking in the fridge to see if people had food in the refrigerator while they were there like those extra steps are are just uh really important and um i i just am thrilled about this um, another thing is that Easton was designated an age-friendly community a couple of years ago, and there's a committee that's working on an action plan uh, right now. And one of the one of the things they're focusing on is communication. So um, they're going to be uh, having some flyers out at town meeting to talk a little bit about the presentations that will come up about that. But the communication part will tie in a lot with what you're trying to do. And this committee can actually help get the word out as well. Um, and you know, age friendly the, from uh, you know from children all the way up to our oldest uh, neighbors is, is everyone's going to benefit from this. So it's really terrific. Um, so thank you for all that you've done with that. But I'd be remiss if I didn't call out uh, the incredible work that happened in the last week. Um, for people at home that don't know that the, when the emergency operations center gets um, triggered, if you will, um, Chief Alexander is the person that heads that up. Um, there's daily calls, sometimes more than one call, um, with with the chief, with Kristen, um, with uh, the fire department, with police, with the schools, with Stonehill, with Connor. Um, I was able to join some of the calls, and everybody really works together as a team. Um, some of the things that I heard when I heard that you guys were knocking on people's doors to ask them about that, I mean, that's really just over and above. And, um, you know, I know that I, I and the rest of the board really appreciate all the extra work that you that you uh, had to do in this past week and still show show up tonight fresh as a daisy everybody looks well rested and uh, you'd never know it so thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate all of you having us again tonight and uh, it's uh, it will come back anytime you'd like an update on this program because it will continue to develop so we look forward to bringing it to you. All right, terrific. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to do what we're doing. Thank you. And thanks for being here tonight. All right, we could keep you here all night and ask you tons more questions, but we will uh, we will let you go and um, hope to talk about this again real soon. Thank you. Thank you. Great work. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so the next item that we have on the agenda is the wayfinding working group appointments. We are filling up that uh, that committee and the final nominations have been submitted to be considered for appointment by the select board for the wayfinding working group. And that's Joan Lundgren to represent the Easton Shoveltown Cultural District, Mark Lamb to represent the Economic Development Council and Steve Gato to represent the Recreation Commission. Um, so we, if everybody is in agreement, we would do those appointments by a roll call vote and we can call it the, refer to it as the slate. So if somebody would like to make a motion to nominate the slate. So moved, Barger. Second, Lamb. That's Barger and Lamb. Back to you, Craig. Barger, the slate. Lamb, slate. Kevin, slate. Casey, slate. And Fulginetti, slate. Um, next is a discussion and vote on the contract with MHQ for the police vehicle POL2022-01. We have a memo in our packet that was submitted by uh, Chief Sullivan. The contract with MHQ is for the purchase of one marked 2021 Ford Interceptor utility all-wheel drive. The contract amount is $43,716.50. The fiscal year 2022 capital budget request for the police department was approved at town meeting on May 17th, 2021. So this has already been accounted for and this is just to uh, vote on the contract, place the order. Anyone have any comments or questions? Would somebody like to make a motion to approve this contract? So moved, Barger. Second, Lamb. Roger and Lamb? Roger, yes. Lamb, yes. Evans, yes. Stacy, yes. And Fulginetti, yes. 
The next item up is discussion and vote for the Blanche A Elementary School for Brake Builders Corp project change order number three. Connor, you wanna walk us through this? Sure, and uh, if there are super detailed questions, we do have Walter Hartley from uh, PMA, our owner's project manager here as well. So uh, as the board will recall, um, I think this year, although everything blurs uh, at this point, you voted to adopt a technical review committee process where a, a, a team uh, of professionals, myself, Dave Field, Ken Carlson from the school planning committee, uh, Dave Twombly and Sam Cedarbaum, plus our owner's project managers, have a, a standing weekly meeting where we review uh, potential change orders submitted by the general contractor for the Blanche Ames Elementary School project. Uh, and the TRC only makes a yes or no decision on those after it's already been reviewed by our architect and recommended by our owner's project manager, including the normal back and forth uh, horse trading uh, that happens with any project of a scale on pricing, hours, materials, that type of thing. Uh, from there, we basically bundle uh, groups of approved changes together uh, once they reach a certain point and bring them to the board for uh, execution. Uh, the point of having this process is so we can keep construction moving in a timely manner and give the green light on things as it needs. Uh, so in your packet, you have the third one of those change order bundles. It's uh, $432,000. Something based on feedback uh, from board members early in this process that we put in every memo for your uh, benefit and I think the public's as well is a, a pretty simple tracking system of how much of the contract time has elapsed versus how much contingency have we spent. That's a pretty good metric for keeping an eye on whether or not change orders are staying within a reasonable amount. And we include a third metric, which is uh, contingency outstanding, assuming we uh, basically said yes to every pending change order on the books that's currently being negotiated. So uh, right now, or as of last week, we were at 29.5%, uh, so almost 30% of the contract time has passed. Uh, with this 400,000, uh, you would be at 13% of contingency being expended. Um, and then there's 10% more kind of floating out there that's not yet um, resolved. But even if you took a, a worst case view and added the 10% as a potential, you would have 23% compared to 30% of the time elapsing. This also doesn't include uh, Walter, correct me if I'm wrong. This is the budgeted contingency. It does not include uh, the savings in the budget compared to actuals versus what we budgeted. So um, I think we're doing quite well. Um, I'm very comfortable with this uh, rate of change order uh, on the project. Uh, and in the memo uh, for your and the public's edification, there is the attached high, very detailed notes um, as far as what are what's in this. Um, and if the board has any questions about them, Walter is here to answer. Terrific. Any questions, Craig? I just have the question about the underground septic chamber removal, I'm, I'm just for my own edification. Yep, yep absolutely. Uh, so uh, we actually have two of those. So the uh, first PCO um, came in was identified on the drawings that there was some type of structure. Uh, there was a little bit of uh, uh, back and forth along with some disagreement. Um, so PMA and the town and the Arch and Perkins Eastman had recommended that um, we split it into two pieces and make sure that we get the contractor paid so that we keep everyone as whole as we can as we move through the process. So that's the first piece. Um, and that, that was more under the southwesterly side of the site. It was in the middle of the building pretty much. Um, so that's the first PCO 01A, the 33,760. Uh, the larger piece, Craig, that I think you're referencing is uh, PCO 11, underground septic chambers at D-Wing. Um, so if you're, I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with the project. I know a couple of, we have a couple of familiar faces and crossover with the building committee, uh, school planning committee, but um, under the building are what we call rammed aggregate piers or wraps, uh, and they help stabilize the soil. Um, and those go down anywhere from eight to 15 feet uh, under the building, under the footings. Um, and, and it's uh, just a, 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 geotechnical, a geotechnical engineering way to um, avoid grade beams across the entire site and, and utilize these. 
Um, so while we were actually excavating for one of our underground infiltration systems, we noticed some not so good uh, soils. So we kept digging. We ended up finding about 18 feet down, 16 feet down in some areas, uh, an entire other underground leaching chamber pit um, made of concrete, same as the other one, uh, that were not identified on the drawings. Um, so they were not captured in the bid to be removed um, after some go around with the structural engineer and the geotechnical engineer. We did determine that the safest thing for uh, everyone's case is to take those out, uh, dig them out, and then bring that entire area back up with structural uh, um, soil, structural fill, compacted in one foot lifts, tested every lift. Um, so you can imagine the process that is to dig down 15 feet, take out the concrete, take out the sand that was under it and bring it back up with structural fill. Um, so it took about 15 working days of anywhere from a crew of four to seven or eight people on the site work crew. Um, but that is what that PCO represents. It's a cost that was um, unfortunately unforeseen, um, but I think uh, in my mind, I'm actually very glad we found it uh, while digging for that underground infiltration system, because if not, we likely would not have found it. Um, and there could have been something compromised on the structural. And now we know that we don't have an issue there, um, which makes me able to sleep at night. Um, and again, it wasn't captured in the bid, so it wasn't a cost that uh, we were anticipating it was an unforeseen condition and and really just a good use of contingency. Thank you, Walter. No Mark. Hi, Walter. How are you? I'm doing all right. How are you? I'm doing outstanding. Uh, I do have a couple questions. I'm sure you were expecting that. Yes. Um, so, uh, you know, you you mentioned uh, the bulk of this is the 353, that change order you were just talking about. Um, uh, four guys, 15 working days, I would imagine something along the lines of like, you know, 500 man hours for something like that. I don't want to get into the weeds of this because, you know, that's what you guys do. Um, but uh, how big of a structure was this? And I'm very uh, glad you caught it because, I mean, Jesus, if it, I shouldn't say that yeah. on camera. But yeah. um, it, that no. means you don't want a building on that. Yeah, it was, it was actually like uh, um, 40 feet by 125 feet long. Um, so it was it was uh it was not chain, small it was not no it was not small um i wish i had a picture to pull up offhand quick for you um but it was it was a large structure and the other one the other one um just for reference in the middle of the building was 120 by 185 feet um but again th that one being disputed a little bit um the, the way it was called out, but the, the one in the center of the site was larger. This one was a little bit smaller, but nothing 60 by 125 is still nothing to sneeze at. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to point out and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Walter, but you know, it's not the, it's not just the man hours that go into this, uh, the material that goes in, you can't replace it with what you take out. You have to actually buy new material. So now you're filling a hole 120 feet by whatever, by 15 feet deep. That's a lot of material and to compact that in lifts at one foot. I mean, I'm surprised it was actually only 480 hours uh, or 500 ish. So um, I'm very glad you caught that. Um, the other question I have is we have on here 29.5% uh, of the contract time has elapsed, uh, which is a good measure, uh, but I'm curious about, um, it's, it's a good measure in comparison to- um, Contingency expended to the expanded, but what I'm more interested in is how much are we through the project? So not time, but work complete. Like are oh. we 40% complete on the project? That's a number that I'm really. Yep. So so you mean, uh, we, are you more or less asking uh, build, build to date through the construction? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're about 20, a little over 25% um, complete. Uh, build okay. to date through the contract. Yep. So really right on time with those things. Um, and you'll see those will, um, that that ref, reference point that you're using there, contract time versus um, budget, it'll actually spike when we have a big purchase during, you know, say our mechanical units are coming to the site. We have 11 RTUs that are, you know, four, five, six, seven million dollars. Um, when those come to the site and they get built and installed, you'll actually see the contract value or the uh, work in place will jump as opposed to the contract time. So 
it'll dwindle off as you head towards the end of the project. But there are some spikes. So structural steel would be one spike where we might have got ahead on mm -hmm. billing, and that's complete now. And then you know you'll see another one during mechanicals. Okay. Um, so you know, twenty five percent complete with thirteen percent contingency expended is great. Um, you know, obviously we we're staying on top of it because. You could be 50%, 75%, 80% done and think you're out of the woods and then something happens and, you know, that's a 25% contingency gets eaten up, you know, when you think you're in the home stretch. So um, please, you know, continue to be vigilant and, and daily, uh, thank you. daily, if not hourly. Yeah, I know. I, and I, I remember I work with, I work with you on the, on the, the school building committee and my, and you were, you are very methodical and, uh, you know, uh, nothing slides by you. So thank you for all you do, Walter. No problem. Thank you. Um, Walter, good to see you again. You too. And, and yes, uh, I'll just uh, second that having the opportunity to work alongside you for, uh, you know, a couple of years there. It's just great knowing that uh, you guys are, are part of the team. And so thank you for the continued diligence and, and hard work and keeping this project uh, in unbelievable uh, fashion, just keeping it on time and, and on budget and finding and mitigating huge potential risks like this. So that's great. Thank you. Absolutely. Jen. Yeah, no questions. Just agreed. Thank you so much for your continued diligence on behalf of the taxpayers of Easton and great job managing this project. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so Dottie, if there's no other questions, um, I I have some photos I wanted to go over with the with the group. I had sent them over to Elizabeth, so she has them. Um, sure. But I just want to give you guys a quick construction update. And if you haven't been to the site, and you know, for you guys and for the public as well. Okay, terrific. Awesome. So, share my screen. Have we gotten any drone footage? Uh, Drone footage, like videos, I'm not sure if we have them. Um, let me go full screen here. Walter, I don't know if it's part of your planned photos, but speaking of photography, I think it something that I think a decision was made by school planning committee to make uh, the photo documenting of the interior and where all wiring and HVAC will be going. Um, if you want to also just touch base on that, I think that's a really great uh, really incredible thing for us to have for buildings and grounds and maintenance moving forward. Yes, I'm not sure if we touched on that at one of our last meetings, but um, that was a decision made by um, the school planning committee. We've actually really started recommending it to a lot of clients. Um, it's called MultiVista. I, I believe it's MultiVista. On-site IQ, I'm sorry. Um, but someone visits the site, I believe weekly, uh, and kind of, if you can picture the Google car driving around, um, it's a Google helmet that they walk around with and they walk around the entire site, same path. So they have a full, uh, 360 degree photo of every area of the building. So you can see everything and you'll be able to get the progression. You'll be able to scale items off the building. So if there's ever any type of issues or if just future changes that are happening, um, you'll have almost an exact, we, we call it an MEP exact built pretty much. Um, so that's something that the town will have for um, the rest of the life of the school, which is great. Um, so just some big happenings. I, I think a lot of people might have been at this, but on the left, you'll see a photo of the uh, topping off ceremony. It was in the uh, beginning of September, um, kind of a tradition, uh, the last piece of steel. Typically it's the highest piece of steel, but a lot of times it ends up being a ceremonial last piece of steel. Uh, you'll see some of the uh, logos on there, it's Town of Easton, MSBA, uh, PMA and Bray and Perkins Eastman. Um, what we were able to do above those logos is have um, as many people as we could sign the beam. So we placed these uh, vinyl stickers all around the town. Um, they were collected and then people were able to sign them and they were placed on the beam before it went up. So you see the tree and the American flag uh, up there. So that was a really a big ceremony uh, to, to happen. It's a big piece of, um, you know, a part, big part of the project. Uh, on the right, you'll see probably one of the most progressed areas of the building. Uh, this is a photo from September 9th. Uh, it was exterior framing. You see the punch outs in the framing. Uh, those are all windows. The building is going to have a ton of natural light in it. Um, and, and those are just kind of the areas. On the right, you'll actually see the mock-up. Um, it's a mock-up panel. So they do a window. Uh, they put all of the assemblies on the exterior of the building uh, up. And they see how they tie together. They also do some... Um, 
testing on it. Um, but before anything goes on the building, it's tested on that mock-up ball and reviewed and approved and coordinated through the architect uh, and the uh, builder. Uh, on the left, you'll see uh, some hot and cold water piping uh, for those mechanical units. Uh, they're getting ready for, excuse me, um, MEP rough in So that's what those are going all through the building. Uh, those will then be insulated as they're running around. Uh, on the right, you'll see the ductwork for those uh, rooftop units. And just below that, you see the rainwater leaders, those RWLs, uh, basically taking all the water from the roof of the building and getting it into those infiltration systems that I was men uh, mentioning. Uh, we're not allowed to have any water leave the site more than it uh, was going to uh, in the first place uh, without the building there. So um, those, that's why those infiltration systems exist. Uh, up on the left, you'll see the roof. So right now uh, we are uh, temped in on the roof uh, and they're trying to keep it uh, really weather tight. Uh, we don't have any insulation. We don't have any membrane yet. Um, we're expecting those in the next couple of weeks. So the final roof will be going on, but right now we are temped in. Uh, you can see some of the structural framing. Uh, those are actually mechanical screens uh, to block and, and house the mechanical units. Uh, so they'll assist with um, aesthetics, hiding those units. So you'll see some nice metal panels or some exterior on, on those instead of seeing the units from the ground and from the neighbors and, and really all around the school. Uh, it'll also ass assist with um, any noise coming from those units. Uh, you, know, you know, you still may hear um, something, but uh, it'll be within the tolerances allowable. Uh, but they do assist with both visual and audible uh, issues. So on the left, we, we have five retaining walls on the site. Uh, we call this one uh, retaining wall five. Um, it is on the eastern eastern part of the easterly part of the site. Um, it's 18 feet deep at some points. You can kind of see um, on the right a uh, picture of the south end, the, on the left, the north end that was more advanced. Um, but you can see uh, the, the construction worker down there um, where it's about six feet as he steps up, the, the wall actually steps up higher where you can see the paneling coming. Um, so that is now complete. Uh, they're backfilling it at this point. Um, there'll be um, some temporary parking in that area. Uh, on the left, you'll see another picture of building E uh, and our underground electrical that's uh, service that's been run. Uh, we've actually poured a slab since then. Uh, so the slab is complete in there. Uh, all the underground MEPs are complete. On the right, you'll see a photo of the new and improved, uh, what will be uh, Spooner, the Spooner Street um, with the parking lot. So Spooner Street does end up running through the parking lot um, as shown. Um, and the teachers are using it. There hasn't been any issues. The structures are in. Um, they did a great job to get that done. So very happy with that. Uh, on the left, uh, actually, these are our cameras. Uh, so we, as Connor mentioned, we have um, the on-site IQ, but we also have site cameras. Uh, those are available to view for the public if you go to the Blanche Ames Project website. Um, you can get a link to those and, and be able to see kind of real time. It takes a photo every 15 minutes, which is really nice. Um, but I was able to grab these. So this is a picture from uh, our August building committee on the left. And then you can see the progress that's been made as of today. Um, so on the, on the right, you'll see all the structural steel, the CMU uh, blocking uh, for the stairwells. Uh, what you're looking at is the central administration building on um, with the mechanical screening. So it's the one story area. Um, and then they're getting ready to pour that slab next week. Uh, the uh, slab on deck has already been poured. The slab on grade is like is going to be poured next week. So that's camera one. Uh, camera two, uh, camera one is actually from basically at the corner of park, uh, the old park view. Camera two is actually at the site entrance. So you see uh, on the left, um, not a lot of work done, just structural steel. Um, but since then, all of those slabs have been poured. The exterior framing is going. You can see the, wood, the blocking for the windows on those openings now that I was mentioning. And you can see the purple, um, we call it Dens Deck. It's actually not Dens Deck. That's a different company. It's um, EXP Jip Sheathing. Uh, built for the exterior, fiberglass on the exterior. So it can take you know, the weather right now. 
Um, in the next picture, you'll see kind of the progression. So you'll see the building kind of morph over the next, you know, few months, um, but it's going to change quite a few times in color. Uh, so camera three, um, you can see uh, this is from the walkway right outside of our trailers from the pathway between RO and the high school. Um, you'll see no framing on the left. And then actually what we have is our uh, air vapor barrier membrane that's actually go, gone up over that uh, dense deck. So it went from purple to gray. And then following the gray, you're going to see um, in some areas some Z clips go on and the, uh, the panels will be held there. You'll see some um, rock wool insulation be stuffed in beside there. So what we have on the building is a rain screen. So it allows water to penetrate the exterior sheathing systems. It gets more or less to this air vapor barrier membrane, drips down and comes out the bottom. It allows the building to breathe uh, while not letting moisture in, which is really nice. So quite a progression. Um, this is again, uh, you know, about two months worth of work, um, but it's really nice to see the progress as it's going. So just wanted to share those with you guys and, and with everyone uh, in the town. Thank you so much, Walter. Adding this to the list of things I never thought in my whole life I would ever know anything about and the details that went into this uh, school project and it's it's just really, really incredible. Um, if anybody ever had time on their hands and wanted to watch some of those meetings and see some of the discussion and the decisions down to, you know, basically the door handles, it's just really amazing. So uh, very appreciative that we selected uh, you and PMA consultants to, to be the project manager because you've been doing a really great job and uh, that makes us feel comfortable. So um, with that, um, if somebody would like to make a motion to accept change order number three. So moved, Barger. Second, Lamb. Barger and Lamb, back to you, Craig. Barger, yes. Lamb, yes. Evans, yes. Stacy, yes. And full Jeanette, yes. Thank you so much. We appreciate you being here tonight, Walter. We know that you work a long day. So uh, really happy to have you here. No problem. Thank you, Thank Walter. You guys, appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Walter. All right. Talk to you later. Bye. All right. Next, uh, we have a discussion and vote for the November 8th, 2021 special town meeting. Um, the art Article 5 payment of bills from a prior fiscal year. Sure. So uh, we actually have a bill to pay. Um, so we have this um, article on all of our town meeting war warrants in the event that during our fiscal year uh, closeout process, we find a bill uh, or a requisition that uh, we uh, need to pay. And we did. It is a $7,700 or $7,740 bill uh, to replace firefighting foam with PFAS free firefighting foam. Uh, that's part of the town's ongoing efforts to uh, mitigate PFAS, uh, not just by constructing plants to remove it from the environment, uh, from our water more accurately, uh, but to uh, where we can um, stop procuring products that have it. Um, just a reminder, I know everyone on board is very tuned into this, but roughly 80% of people's exposure is not through water, it's through consumer goods that are almost entirely unregulated in the United States. Um, state is working uh, on that, and we'll see some news coming out of that this year, hopefully. Uh, but we're we're doing what we can where we can, and this is part of it. So uh, this was a bill um, that uh, needs to be paid. So we already swapped that out. Seven thousand seven hundred forty dollars. It would be funded through uh, water enterprise funds as part of a water division's uh, PFAS mitigation. Terrific. So I did we already vote to include this or are we looking you to did. recommend? Just a recommendation. So the warrant's already printed um, and that's okay. Uh, so this would just be a vote to recommend it that you would announce from the floor of town meeting. Okay. So would somebody like to make a motion to recommend article five? I move to recommend article five for the special town meeting. Second, Lamb. Barger and Lamb. Barger, yes. Lamb, yes. Evans, yes. Stacy, yes. And full Janetti, yes. Terrific. Next up, the town administrator update on COVID-19 response in Easton. Sure. Thank you, Dottie. So um, we uh, periodically provide these uh, presentations about once a month now. Uh, used to be every meeting. 
Um, but the goal is just to give a broad overview of trends uh, nationally, uh, regionally, and here locally, as well as what uh, impact that's having on our decision making and what services uh, we are offering to continue um, the work of, of making vaccines available and uh, uh, coming through the pandemic in as good shape as we can. So uh, the United States is uh, nearing 46 million cumulative cases of COVID. Um, and uh, uh, nearing uh, 750,000 uh, uh, deaths on a national scale. Thankfully, um, the trend of uh, daily cases is declining. If you look at the slide on the far right-hand side, it's declining rather rapidly um, from the kind of Delta surge in August and September that we saw this year. Uh, that was largely uh, driven in the less vaccinated states, but it, it, it hit everywhere, including here. Um, right now, the rolling uh, daily average in the United States is uh, 72,000. Uh, this is down from 107,000 cases a day at your last presentation in October, and is down from the summer uh, or the late summer peak of about 160,000 a day. Uh, there's over 40,000 Americans of a hospital right now, but again, that is a, a, a meaningful drop. You're looking at about two thirds of where we were a month ago and declining. Uh, this is a, a website that aggregates a few metrics on uh, COVID risk levels, including new cases, infection rate, and the test positive rate. Uh, still um, uh, moderate level risk in a lot of states, uh, but we again are improving. This was from early October, so moving in the right direction. In Massachusetts, uh, where seven day average is about 899 cases a day. That has improved from about 1,070 cases per day at your last meeting. Test positive rate on average is about 1.7% of tests coming back positive. Again, improvement from your last meeting. There's 530 residents of the Commonwealth in the hospital right now, which is again an improvement from your last meeting um, and is significantly lower uh, in the, the worst uh, surge from a case perspective over this past winter of 2020. There was about 22 to 2,400 folks in the hospital and in the first spring surge in April 2020, although the cases don't look like it because as you all recall, tests were basically impossible to get. There was more than 4,000 residents in the hospital in Massachusetts. So um, doing significantly better than both of those times and we're moving in a positive direction, although not as fast as some of us would like to see. Uh, looking at just shy of 2,500 total cases in Easton in the duration of a pandemic, and just shy of 70 residents having lost their lives. That number has not moved meaningfully, thankfully, this year once the, uh, vaccines became available, uh, again, which is one of the, the really marquee and important aspects of getting vaccinated. Even if you do end up getting COVID with a, a rare breakthrough, the likelihood you'll get sick and die is significantly less. And uh, our data shows that. This uh, shows the uh, controlled uh, per capita cases in Easton um, and the risk level. So we had a, a couple months where we were having close to no cases, uh, which was wonderful. Uh, you'll see a peak in late August um, and it's slowly starting to come down. These are the actual raw number of cases. So we uh, hit uh, the, around Labor Day near 40 cases per week, um, which is higher than we were comfortable with. That's when we uh, instituted masks uh, in municipal buildings for visitors and mandated that all employees have to provide evidence they've been vaccinated uh, or else they have to have a mask on at all times at work. Uh, we've been moving downward, um, although we're still kind of stuck hovering around in that 20 case per week area, um, but still an improvement from a month or two ago. Test positive rate in the Commonwealth, as I said before, is about 1.76%. Easton is slightly below that. Uh, at 0.87%. Uh, I always give the obvious caveat that Stonehill has a very robust uh, ongoing asymptomatic test program. So they capture a lot of negatives, thankfully. Uh, and that, um, that makes uh, our test rate look quite good. Uh, I would suspect even without that, it would still look quite good because the total number of cases we're getting is not um, out of control. Uh, already touched on, and there's there's nothing meaningfully different from last month. Uh, our buildings are open to the public. We ask that they wear a mask because obviously we do not know their vaccine status when they come in. Uh, we're still having our meetings on Zoom. Um, we're working on uh, some of the uh, technology for hybrid 
uh, meetings for perhaps some of our regulatory boards uh, with ECAT and, and purchasing cameras and things like that. Um, and we'll probably have more to say on that soon. Um, special town meeting is a week from now. It is back at the high school for the first time in I think two years. Um, we will be asking everyone to wear a mask regardless of your vaccine status uh, because it's a school facility. Uh, but other than that, it will look a lot more like a normal town meeting, which is the first time we've said that in a very, very long time. Uh, vaccine update. Uh, there are booster shots available now. Since the last meeting, uh, FDA and CDC uh, voted to recommend and make available booster shots of all three currently authorized vaccines in the United States, whether Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, or Moderna, and they okayed mix and match uh, for eligible populations. Um, there is information about that on the state website. And if you are unsure uh, about whether a booster makes sense for your age group or your work, you could review that information online, or you could always, of course, speak with your doctor or healthcare provider. Uh, statewide, Massachusetts continues to be a leader uh, with vaccine administration. I think it's important to note here that if, when you look here, percent of population that's received at least one dose, that's the total population, including everyone under 12 who can't get a dose right now. So even with that baked in, 80% of all people living in Massachusetts uh, have received at least one dose. United States is behind compared to Massachusetts, but I think today uh, passed a pretty significant milestone that 80% of all adults in America have received one dose of COVID vaccine, which is huge uh, and moving in the right direction. This is Easton's vaccine data. There's a ton of numbers here, so I try to just uh, point out the important ones, um, which I added, so again, that other slide has uh, this kind of total all, how many people, how, what percent of people have received one dose. That's useful, but I also think it's from a policy perspective, good to look at how many people who are actually able to get a dose, right? If you're counting 11, you know, infants through 11, they, they can't get a dose right now, although that looks like it may change as soon as tomorrow for five to 11. Uh, so we added this uh, row of total eligible populations uh, it's in yellow, and uh, out of those age 12 and up in Easton, 84% have had at least one vaccine dose, which is incredible. 76% um, are fully vaccinated. Um, 12 to 15 year olds, 73% fully vaccinated, and, and every uh, month are adding a couple points on that, so that's moving in a great direction. Um, and again, I, we, we expect, I think, the CDC panel is meeting tomorrow. Um, to uh, review uh, authorization of Pfizer for 5 to 11. So a lot of good progress being made in the community, um, even with the uh, kind of 16 to 30 year old group, which has lagged behind every other age group, uh, they are over 50% fully vaccinated now and making some progress, which is good. So Easton uh, will be holding a vote and vax uh, clinic, uh, the night of special town meeting again, uh, They've been relatively well received, uh, which is great. We want to do what we can, uh, although obviously the vaccine is super available at this point. Uh, we think it never hurts to have it uh, be uh, offered somewhere where people are already going to be. And so uh, this will be a longer clinic uh, because we're also we're going to have flu vaccine on hand. We'll have Pfizer uh, vaccines, first shots on hand. And if, if you're eligible, you can get a booster as well. So lots of um, opportunities there. Uh, so the, the kind of technical text is flu vaccine for ages three and up, Pfizer COVID vaccine for ages 12 and up, and Pfizer COVID booster for anyone who's eligible. If between right now and Monday, the CDC approves a five to 11 year old doses uh, and Rite Aid gets kind of a paperwork in order, then we would plan to offer uh, Pfizer vaccines for that age group as well. Um, and if that, that's the case, we'll obviously publicize that heavily. An annual town meeting in May uh, was, I think, a week after 12 to 16 year olds got authorized. And we all laughed a little bit with ourselves that it was vote and vax, and the overwhelming number of people who came from the vaccine are not old enough to vote. But we were still uh, more than happy to do it because it is uh, a super important public health measure. So maybe we'll get a repeat of that. Uh, the clinic will be from 4 to 6.45 in the atrium at the OA High School. Uh, insurance is not required, uh, but if you have it, we would collect it. Um, and there's no copay to be charged, so it's free. 
whether you have insurance or not. Uh, people who would like to get a vaccine or a booster uh, need to just register in advance. There's a link here. It's on the town's social media, on Twitter and Facebook, and it's on our website as well. So that is what I have. Great. Thank you, Connor. Any questions for comments from anyone on the board? It feels like we've been talking about this forever. <laughs> it really it does. has been uh, forever, uh, yeah. uh, emotionally. <laughs> I, know, I know. Well, um, thank you again for, for the update and for everything that uh, town staff is doing to really keep these things moving forward. Um, you know, we did get, you know, calls and emails and, and notes even in the mail that I got from people really saying how much they appreciated the leadership in East and, and that we were always, you know, ahead of the curve in, in trying to make the right decisions for the community. So um, I really appreciate the support for that, for that. So with that, we will go to the acceptance of the minutes, October 18th, 2021. Would somebody like to make a motion to accept those minutes? So move, Barger. Second, Lamb. Roger, Lamb. Barger, yes. Lamb, yes. That was a Stebbins yes, but we couldn't hear you. <clears throat> oh, he lost his audio. All right. Uh, I don't know that we can count that with um, without a, an actual vocal, but uh, Jen? AC, yes. And full Jeanette, yes. I think Jamie's going to try to reconnect. Um, does anybody have any selectman notes? Craig? Uh, no, not at the moment. Other than, than to, once again, you've already said it, Dottie, a number of people have said it, how, how much we appreciate the efforts on the part of town staff, first responders, DPW, everybody over this last week. It's this extraordinary storm. Um, and um, thanks to, uh, to you, Dottie, and to our state senators and state reps who were in touch with uh, not only us, but with National Grid and trying to push them to, uh, to respond to our need. Um, and um, uh, we, we all appreciate the work that Connor and your folks have done uh, over the last uh, week. Great. Yeah, uh, piggyback on that, that was, you took the words out of my mouth. Um, they went above and beyond this past week, absolutely outstanding. Uh, and specifically the DPW and, and the fire chief and, and health and community services, they really, they, they were phenomenal out there, um, even with their updates. I mean, uh, constant updates. Um, and I can't imagine what they were doing in real time. Um, and I'm only reading updates. So uh, absolutely incredible. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Mark. Jamie, are you back? There you are. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. All right. Did you have any comments that you wanted to share with the board? Yes, um, yeah, I did want to say too that uh, uh, it was great to get to visit the EOC on Saturday and thank you to all of you who contributed to uh, the lunch that we delivered uh, on Saturday to DPW Fire and Police. It was uh, very well received and uh, great to catch up with Connor and Dave and really uh, see them in action. Um, and it was still a very critical time, I think, on Saturday as a lot of crews were still in town and a lot going on. So thank you for their time, for taking the time with me that they did. I also want to just mention uh, Veterans uh, Day. We do have the Town of Easton's 2021 Veterans Day ceremony. Town of Easton will honor and celebrate Veterans Day on Thursday, November 11th at 11 a.m. at Veterans Memorial Park at 68 Pond Street, Northeastern. Uh, we will have Easton resident Brigadier General Ronald Couples as our guest speaker. There'll be veterans, scouts, members of local and state government, and the OAHS band in attendance, among other guests. Uh, please spread the word and come out to support our veterans past and present. All are welcome and encouraged to attend. In case of inclement weather, please gather at the Easton VFW at 61 Rockland Street at 11 a.m. Please contact Corey Honan at 774-273-1991 with any questions. Thanks so much, Jamie. Appreciate that. So I just wanted to uh, really underscore that for November 8th special town meeting, we really need people to show up. We wanna get a quorum early. We don't wanna be there all night. It, there's nothing controversial. We don't have marijuana or housing or zoning or anything, anything that's gonna draw people out except to come and really get this important work done and get to see each other in person again. 
Um, so please, you know, share it with your neighbors and friends. And, you know, if town meeting gets out early, maybe you can get together with your neighbors and go out and get appetizers somewhere local. Um, so we definitely shop local and dine local. Um, the next thing that I wanted to mention is to thank everybody that came out to drug take back day. They collected a total of 199 pounds of medication and five boxes of sharps. Uh, thank you to the Easton Police, the Eastern Board of Health, and Eastern Wings of Hope Substance Use Coalition for putting that together. It's a really great step to keep that medication out of your medicine cabinets. Um, it just amazes me how much comes back every year. And for people that didn't make it, there's a drug kiosk in the police station in the, in the doors. Um, you just go in, drop your meds off, no questions asked. And super excited to hear tonight now that there's a Sharps uh, drop off box at the fire station on Bay Road. It's very expensive to dispose of Sharps, and people save those all year for you know people that have diabetes and, and uh, things like that um, to save those all year to dispose of. And we get that question a lot is where they can dispose of it in the meantime. So I'm very excited to hear that and the great work that the MIH group is doing. So uh, with that, I will take a motion to adjourn. So moved, Barger. Second, Lamb. Barger and Lamb? Barger, yes. Lamb, yes. Evans, yes. Ace, yes. And Fulginetti, yes. Thanks so much for being here tonight, everyone, and everyone watching at home. Have a great week. See you all on the 8th. See you at town meeting. <laughs>